Welcome to this presentation on resistant starch, which is one of the seven crucial prebiotics I've reviewed in detail for you. I'll explain to you what resistant starch is, which taxa it increases within the microbiome, and the forms of resistant starch and their subtle differences. I routinely recommend resistant starch as a part of various regimens, but also specifically exclude it from others. As you learn more, you'll begin to understand the many variables of gastrointestinal health. What is resistant starch and why should you care? It is a normal component of your food. However, due to its structure, your gastrointestinal tract is not able to access the sugars within. The good news is that those sugars become fuel for your microbiome. The two recognized resistant starch consumers in the gut are Ruminococcus bromii and Bifidobacterium adolescentis, which you'll be seeing a lot of in this presentation. With their enzymatic machinery, they are readily able to liberate those sugars and more importantly, make them available for other health-promoting bacteria in a process called crossfeeding, which we'll touch on in the presentation. Although you see five different types of resistant starch here, in reality, only two are relevant, types two and three. The most likely source of type three for you would be cooked and cooled potatoes, like in some kind of potato salad. The one we'll focus on is type two, which is readily available in supplement form, which is a very important feature as those who are dysbiotic typically need supplementation to drive significant improvement. When using prebiotics to feed your microbiome, there are three important considerations. One, you should use various types of prebiotics at the same time for the sake of a healthy diversity. Two, the types of prebiotics need to be suited to your specific needs. And three, the dose needs to be efficacious. Here in this slide, we're exclusively looking at a dose for only one prebiotic, resistant starch. At only 10 grams per day, this trial failed to induce any benefit to the microbiome after eight weeks. This is fairly common across all types of prebiotics. I don't recommend the use of only one prebiotic and especially at low dosing. We can see several interesting findings from this resistant starch study. In figure A, the blue arrow shows us that subject 15 didn't even have any detectable levels of Bifidobacterium adolescentis. Although most people will have some detectable levels of B. adolescentis, nobody is going to have all known species of all bacteria in their gut. Each microbiome is unique. So this person relies on Ruminococcus bromii exclusively to degrade resistant starch. The yellow arrow shows us the huge variability in the response of B. adolescentis to the administered resistant starch. For various reasons, we all have our own individual responses to substrates. The green arrow shows us a number of people who didn't even have any detectable levels of our bromii. Finally, the orange arrow sums the responses of the two species and shows that the total abundance of the two increased significantly following the administration of the resistant starch, even though for whatever reason, subjects 5, 24, and 26 had no positive response. Here we have a trial with a complex design which looks at resistant starch in regards to insulin sensitivity. The dosing reached as high as 66 grams per day of resistant starch, which is more than needed in my opinion, but nevertheless produced significantly lower postprandial insulin and glucose responses and highly beneficial microbial changes. On the right side, you can see a great visualization of the taxa impacted by the resistant starch, highlighted in orange. These are some of the true superheroes of the microbiome, and as they don't directly consume resistant starch, they were in fact fed by crossfeeding. So what is this concept called crossfeeding? The individual bacteria of the microbiome possess certain enzymes which help dictate their ability to thrive in a given environment in your gut. What you don't digest in your small intestine is up for grabs in the large intestine. But a given bacteria may not possess an enzyme to unlock a bond on which to feed. It has to wait for another bacteria to unlock the bond and liberate the substrate into a form on which it can feed. These fuels, called substrates, can be many things, but are usually short-chain fatty acids, liberated sugars, organic acids, or amino acids. The real benefit of resistant starch is not necessarily by feeding the primary degraders B. adolescentis and R. bromine, but through the cross-feeding we just discussed. I have analyzed all published papers on many prebiotics to include resistant starch. When looking at only human in vivo studies and humanized in vitro studies, where there is a net positive association of at least two studies, we see here that resistant starch 
has been shown to significantly increase allostypes, Roseburia, Eubacterium rectale, and Calvincella. The genus Roseburia and the species E. rectale are health-promoting superstars in the microbiome. This is the real benefit of resistant starch. It is curious to see allostypes benefiting from resistant starch, given what I know, but the good news is that it too generally is health promoting. Colin Sella has mixed data and tends toward disease promoting across the board. There are probably other taxa which benefit from cross feeding induced by resistant starch, which will be elucidated in more time. Now let's see what we just covered put into action. In this research paper, 174 healthy young adults consumed one of three prebiotics for two weeks, which included resistant starch from potatoes, resistant starch from maize, Inion from chicory root, or acorn starch control. Doses were variable, but were at least 20 grams per day. As we can see from the blue app, the high amylose maze was significantly correlated with parabromia, and the yellow arrow shows a significant correlation between potato starch and B. adolescentis. Two things we'll see more of shortly. On the right side of the screen, the green arrow shows a significant correlation between arabromiae and the prolific butyrate producer E. rectile, while the orange arrow highlights a significant correlation between B. adolescentis and anerostypes, one of three very interesting species which are able to convert lactate directly to butyrate. In this study, fecal samples from 10 healthy individuals were used as the inoculum for fermentation with 10 different starch sources. Figure C highlights the different starting microbiome compositions between the 10 samples in this in vitro study. The wide blue arrow highlights five of the ten samples which fail to contain any detectable levels of our bromii, once again highlighting individual variability, while the yellow arrow highlights the one sample without B. adolescentis. In figure D, the green arrow highlights the strong R. bromii response to high amylose maize, while the orange arrow shows the strong B. adolescentis response to the potato starch. Both species ultimately had a big butyrate response, again through cross-feeding. In vitro studies like these are useful for several reasons, one of which is the ability to measure butyrate, since in patients there is wide variability in butyrate absorption in the gut, which often sways results. Our bromiohyte strong positive correlations with superhero bacteria such as Eubacterium rectale, Roseburia facies, Roseburia inulinivorans, and Fecalibacterium prausitia while Bifidobacterium adolescentis had strong positive correlations with other fantastic species, such as Coprococcus eutactus, Anerostypes hadris, and Fecalibacterium prausitiae. In the end, you can't go wrong with either, but there are subtle differences between them in order to maximize your outcome. Here is a summary of all of the resistant starch utilizing studies available, both in patients and in humanized in vitro studies where a significant increase in abundance was found for either Bifidobacterium adolescentis or Ruminococcus bromia. This is the kind of information you'll find nowhere else. The agent numbers you see are called PMID numbers, which you can use to find the published research papers. As you can see, Bifidobacterium adolescentis seems equally content to ferment either high amylose maize or potato starch, whereas our bromii seems to be more selective for high amylose maize. So these subtle differences are considerations in your treatment protocol. Considerations which also include the fact that our bromii ultimately probably induces more butyrate production, or that B. adolescentis produces GABA. Also keep in mind, you generally should not heat type 2 resistant starch, although the high amylose maize product is heat tolerant at normal cooking temperatures. There are generally three basic types of resistant starch products you can find in the marketplace. There are easy to find products online, and in grocery stores based on the starch of a tuber, usually potato. Not only are they easy to find, they're also inexpensive, have a high amount of resistant starch by weight, and work fantastic. A second excellent option, which you've already seen referenced in the previous slides, is a proprietary product based upon high amylose maize. Lastly is green banana, which I've never tried in anyone as the price isn't justified and why risk excellent levels of success by trying something new. Just as a point of note, I have no affiliations with either of these companies. Although this webinar is dedicated only to resistant starch, I don't recommend taking it as a single prebiotic. It should be blended and dosed properly 
with others to meet the needs of the individual. In my webinars on various disease states and health concerns, I provide specific recommendations to address the needs of each given average microbial fingerprint I've identified over the years. As for the two products listed here, I've used the Bob's product for many years with great success. It's affordable and easy to find. The High Maze product is only available on this one location to the best of my knowledge. If you've done a microbiome analysis, then your choice between the two can be more precise given the data from some of our previous slides. If not, in the end, they will both be valuable in the right person. I never use resistant starch in those with constipation, and conversely, I always use resistant starch in those with diarrhea. This is not something you can pick up on by reading the literature, but is something that comes with extensive experience. I hope you learned a thing or two from this free presentation. It's a great example of what you'll see if you join my Microbiome University. I have 50 in-depth presentations on deck highlighting every conceivable topic about the microbiome. I'll launch a new Microbiome University presentation each Monday morning, and each Thursday evening, I'll have a large free group webinar for those with questions about the presentation of the week. So join now.